You can hear me? <laughs> oh, everybody get to see me with my twin. <laughs> smile so they can see. People ask me where I get my smile from. See, <laughs> let's smile together. <laughs> oh, how you doing today? I'm doing good, yourself. <laughs> good. Good. So, I wanted to interview you because, as you know, I have my writing program called Life Changing Writing in Five Weeks, and where I help people write their books and mm -hmm. and I give writing workshops. And a lot of people, because they also know that you're my father, um, they have questions. They're like, oh, oh my okay. god, such a talented family. Oh my God, this and the other. And then also when I've come and seen you, uh, you know, when I've traveled with you to places uh -huh. where you've spoken, people would ask me, well, what was it like growing up with a famous dad? And I had to tell him he wasn't famous when I was growing up, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is um, Johnny Come Lately fame, at least for well, me. I don't know what was happening. It's not just people know what I do. <laughs> okay, more people know what you do. Yeah. <laughs> And, and some people see no, that as fame when they're experiencing it. <laughs> so um, what was interesting, uh, well, okay. So I wanna talk about a little bit about like um, the Black Panther Party, just in terms of that, because obviously that's my roots, right? I was born into it as a, what they call us cubs, right? Mm -hmm. And so then how that may have shaped um this artistic expression uh i have of of creating this life changing writing program because a lot of people do go through it and do feel like wow they're they're writing and their 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 world has been transformed by it i'm just repeating what other people say y'all i'm trying I, i'm being humble i'm just repeating what people tell me but <laughs> but um you as the former minister of culture of the black panther party also your work as an artist is transformative and i know that you said that there were times when and you include writing in your artwork yeah, and there was stuff, uh -huh. and there was times when you said like in the beginning that you didn't you got stuck you got kind of like a writer's block you didn't know what to write well, well i didn't know not what to write was more so uh in relationship to uh uh, uh, what ideas to come up with to create artistically, mm -hmm. visually. Yeah. And so that was, uh, you know, I was just, and then, you know, it was a whole different dynamics then and how I came about in the context of the party. I, I hadn't um, had any uh, 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 writing abilities. My training uh, as an artist was uh, formed uh, with my professional skills. Uh, and understanding how to stuff apply it to the Black Panther Party. And what I did was because I took up commercial art at City College, which deals with uh, advertising perspective, uh, figure drawing, lettering, art, poster printing, all those kinds of things. Uh, and putting, uh, designing out publications. And so I became uh, to the point where I was good enough they would send me out on job assignments. And then you, when you work in different jobs that you get, then you begin to understand in the context of how to, to create and put things together. It, sometimes even if you're working at a low end uh, shop that had not a high, low, high end equipment, you still had to get the job done if they had the agreement, the contract. Mm. And so you had, you figure, you know, understand, learn shortcuts and all those things, you know. Mm -hmm. So as, as an artist, that was the foundation of putting things together, learn how to apply it with what, whatever tools I had available. Uh, but as far as the mental blocks, they came from, uh, I, I guess, in the beginning, uh, I, I'm really trying to feel the spirit of what, the, what, we were, what was being done mm -hmm. and interpreting that through the art. The spirit and, of what oh, was yeah. being done, yeah. And so that came about, uh, it was pretty quickly. I mean, it, it came around in, the, in this most basic form is when one time I told elders I was having mental blocks. Mm -hmm. He said, don't worry about what you say or draw uh, uh, it, 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 about this government. It, whatever you do, say it'll be right. So right. that kind of kind of- That's what I was thinking yeah. of, that moment. Yeah, so right. that, that kind of opened it up 
to me being able to just be creative, expressing based on my internal feelings and what I was observing uh, while we were also doing community work and listening to the people's concerns mm -hmm. and interpreting those through the art and what have you. So mm -hmm. I think that played into a lot of the art of what I was doing. And also, we, we know we had, to, we had political education classes, you had to read and you're around all this the stuff that's going on so you can get a, a feel of how to interpret e e in the, uh, the text mm -hmm. within the artwork. Sometimes uh, in the beginning, or maybe I uh, pl plurize text, uh, mm -hmm. words, but then I had a feel. I got a feel for what I, what I wanted the art to say itself. So uh, I'd be able to, and that was given another layer also mm -hmm. to the artwork. Okay. So I just got a feel of what I wanted to say, and I began to be able to use my ability and my imagination and what should be the text that goes with a specific uh, artwork that I was doing for the newspaper. Okay, so I was going to ask you about that. So that's how you would come up with the little the phrases that we would see sometimes at the top of the. Yeah. You would get them yeah. from songs. You would get them from, uh, and then sometimes from your own mind or. Yeah. Huh? I'm, I'm, well, in the beginning. They will uh, look at songs, look at uh, lose a lot of, had a lot of books that dealt with the uh, uh, civil rights movement, and had an all and had a lot of words and context in it of, uh, that I would could p pull from those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. the revolutionary movements around the world, all those things played into the text mm -hmm. uh, that I was applying. So you're constantly just, feeding yourself. Yeah, but then, then it came to a point where I just it came natural. And I just mm. I do it. Yeah. And that's a good point because I do talk I do talk to my clients about that. Like sometimes you have to emulate other people mm -hmm. until you can figure out you get used to to that and then you you'll start to create your own. But even when you're emulating it it doesn't even mean I know you said you would plagiarize but I don't know if that's necessarily plagiarizing by putting like are you calling it plagiarizing when you say like you would put like quote a song or something above in the text is that considered we think that we had to deal with some some pull from somewhere else okay. that had been, been been written yeah okay okay yeah so yeah so i talked yeah that's good that's a good point because i talked to my clients about that like how sometimes not only just that um taking what others done and adding your own spin on it but sometimes you have to model follow the same model that other people have done until you get comfortable enough to, uh, like you said, um, kind of like the, the understand the spirit of, of, a, of a thing and understand mm -hmm. your own spirit and your own flow. And then you will gradually move into creating something, I guess, unique, although everything's been done under the sun, right? There's okay. nothing that hasn't already been done, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just a, a better way of doing it, or maybe a better way of saying it. Uh, interpreting to apply it to your to apply, to interpreting yeah. it right to apply it to a situation right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, maybe, you know you tweak it here tweak it there those kinds of things yes uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> once you've seen one one you've seen one love movie you've seen them all right you know, <laughs> you know right. those kinds of things yeah so so it's, it should never be a question of like oh that's been done before i shouldn't do it do it no, right no, no. yeah yeah because uh what i did is like you could take an example of a, a more recent image done by, i think well east i say about 2008 2000 i think it was when i played off the two kids at the chalkboard first one is it was a black and white one i think i did it in i think i did that one in 1987 mm -hmm. and it said health is wealth mm -hmm. yeah and then i remixed it again and uh, i did that in 1987 with the little boy at the chalkboard board and the girl sitting in the chair. But then in 2008, I remixed, reinterpret that and with uh, a, a color image of, I painted with the little boy at the, and the little girl at the chalkboard. And they got the words where they, and they in the bubble and it says, the big words they're writing is health is wealth. And they both got their markers on that word, one at one beginning, one at the other end, hmm. ending of the word. And I got the bubble saying, one little boy saying, I like this scene. Mm -hmm. The little girl saying, and her bubble saying, yes, yeah, it's non-toxic. Mm -hmm. So 
I remember I had to, I hold, I had to, I wrote almost, almost a paragraph or two trying to say that. And I kept saying, well, no, no, I got to condense it, got to get it down. Then over a period of time, I figured it to, I got it to the point where it has that simple statement. Mm. Uh, yes, yes, non toxic. Yeah. See, now that's a good point, too. And I didn't even know that you would go through a writing process before you even came to your simple phrases. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, because you have to eliminate, you have to, yeah, and that was also a part of the uh, uh, understanding in some certain things that you did in the uh, production aspect or designing aspects that you learned over a period of time putting things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, right, it can't so. be wordy and it, because we always talked about uh, making things uh, when they talked about the visuals mm -hmm. and, and the artwork and all that is also making it even to when a child can get an understanding from it. That part right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it came oh. from, uh, came from uh, I'm going to call it Cabral. Okay. Amir, Amir Clark, Clark Cabral? Yeah. Okay. Well, he, you know, he said he was, he had books and stuff. He done a lot on culture stuff. Okay. But he said you have to be able to speak in a way that even a child can understand you. Mm -hmm. so I, I contemplated that over 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 a while that you have to be able to draw to, in a way that even a child can understand. You. So then get something out of it. Oh, it oh, like, you don't have to lose the depth of it, the meaning right. of it. But you have to when they say it, they can get something from it. And just so so the listeners can know, um, Amilcar Cabral was a revolutionary from where was he from? Yeah, so I think it's from Guinea. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Oh, wow. And and that, that concept that even a child can understand it, we saw that in the film. Did you ever see the film Philadelphia where um, Denzel Washington is playing a lawyer? I say it, but I don't remember that quote. Because uh, he, he, as a lawyer, he kept saying, um, like, explain it to me like I'm a two-year-old. Oh, yes, okay. So yeah. he, it was this concept of this brilliant man, mm -hmm. but the the... As brilliant as he was, he valued the simplicity, right? Well, so, yeah, that because he had to present that to the to the uh, jury. Mm -hmm. And if you simply to the jury, you know, jury ain't gonna get into all that technical in detail. If you can mm -hmm. take a plain common sense, mm -hmm. the better off it is. Practical, yeah. So keep it simple for the people. Keep yes. it simple. Yes. Yeah. And that's interesting because remember um, when I went to France and you connected me with Julia Wright. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard Wright's daughter. And yeah. that was something that um, just in conversation, regular conversation, how she brought up that um, there was one particular author, famous author that she wasn't fond of. And she felt because that author was too complex. And she felt that author could, everything that that author was saying could have been explained in much simpler terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that was the first time that I was kind of like, oh, wow, like, it's okay to be simple. It's okay to just say it in your regular voice. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, when you look at uh, Maya Angelou or, or Tony mm -hmm. Morrison's books or other books, they're not that, uh, they're not that uh, complex in words, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, when you were working at the Sun Reporter, because you guys would get a lot of um, material from different places, uh, and the, these authors, this woman who had edited a book called Nine Nigerian Authors, she had sent a, like a, a press copy to you all and you gave it to me. And I loved that book because those, it was all, it was nine women, Nigerian women uh, authors. And I love that book because they told their stories just so simple in just their own voice. I don't know if it was fiction or nonfiction, but mm -hmm. it just, it came out so simple and I just decided that that was how I'm gonna write <laughs> and that's what I did when I wrote my book I twirl in the smoke mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah mm -hmm. some are scholars and like to write in scholarly terms mm -hmm. you know it's gonna meet that it's gonna be specifically it may not go beyond that audience you know or if right. there is it may be people who are inspired it may be inspired by or captivated by it may not understand it then but maybe get to understand it later as well that's but, true yeah so really it's you just have to do whatever your heart said tells you to do because if your heart tells you to speak in the yeah complex yeah. terminology yeah. It, like you yeah. said the audience that needs to hear it will hear it yeah mm -hmm. but it's for whom that's what you're talking about for whom right in the context of a framework of uh social justice or enlightening informing people about human being human rights qualities and all those issues 
mm -hmm. telling stories, uh, you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. For whom? Who is it? For whom? Right, the audience. Good, good point. Okay, now I want to switch a little bit to uh, being a father and artist in the Black Panther Party. So what was it like to be a parent, specifically a father, mm -hmm. right? raising a child and being in the Black Panther Party? Well, it w w in the children, it was uh, when babies were being born in the party, uh, it was understood that sisters who were connected to the brothers were having babies, but they were also trying to do the work at the same time. Prior to the pregnancy and after the child was at the birth, after birth. Mm -hmm. So we had discussions and meetings how, in particularly, that the mother had to nurse the babies, take care of the babies, answer the phones, all those things. So it became understanding that the child's were how everybody in the party were like the the parents. Like a communal, a communal concept of yeah. Reason. So that's why uh, we became pastors. Brothers had to take care of the children, change diapers, do all those things as well, along with sister. You got mm -hmm. Sister Abacha, who's a radio personality. Yeah, she had who mentioned that that's the first time she had ever seen brothers holding, taking care of the babies. Mm. That, that, that wasn't really a, a common thing on a broad scale mm -hmm. during that time, you see. And so it, it, she, she always mentions that from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a part of the, uh, the process in the party of tender, loving care by everyone of the kids. Mm -hmm. And I remember you were at the child care center when we started our child care center. Mm -hmm. And I used to, a brother used to run it. Name was Anthony Ware, mm -hmm. who was who, from the Seattle chapter who came down here to do some work. And uh, we used to come by, and I got a couple of photographs where you out laying on the ground, playing with a little ball and what have you. Mm -hmm. Check on in between doing the work and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the, so, er, and so the children were the collective of everybody, mm -hmm. whatever chapter and branch you had. The children were the children of of everybody in the black mm -hmm. family. Yeah. yeah, and I know that that was a kind of experimental. It kind of came out of a need, right? Like you said. Oh yeah, yeah. We're well, having kids, it. and it's like, oh, we got to do something. We got to figure out how to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because you knew it was going to be, and those needs, all everything always came out of the needs, out mm -hmm. of growth and development, in relationship to making sure that. Things ran could run as smoothly as possible. Yeah, in harmony. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, my grandmother, my my mother's mother, mm -hmm. um, she would come get me regularly from the childcare. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, she didn't really. She loved the party, and she she would always tell me like, you know, you see those boys standing on the corner. If the party was around, they wouldn't be standing on the corner. They'd have something to do. They'd be selling papers. They'd be doing this. They'd be doing that. And she loved the party, but she she wasn't very fond of the the communal childcare situation. So she made it a point to come get me every as often as she could, so that I could get individual attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to understand that uh, whether it, was, it seeps into the mind in this society of the, uh, the exceptionalism, individualism, mm -hmm. instead of the collective spirit. Yeah, that collective spirit is uh, something communal spirit. Is yeah. about survival and coming together, and of yeah. course, some people do that. But at the same time, this this the system is not engaging people in that context, mm -hmm. and that's very much needed right now. You know, yeah. Maybe but I'm glad. Community. I'm glad. I, I'm glad she came and got me though. I needed that. Yeah, yeah. Attention, so I'm yeah, glad I'm, that she it's did not, that. It's not. I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the 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 the. Uh, the, uh, the uh, and it being a bad thing, I'm just talking oh. about in the context of how, you know, in yeah. the context of what it was, yeah. Right. I mean, communal care, obviously, yeah, like traditionally that's what we come from, right? In indigenous, mm -hmm. African, all, all indigenous groups around the world have like a communal yeah. concept and it, it helps to really, mm -hmm. um, like uh, I remember reading uh, this book by, by uh, Dr. Fukiao called The Babysitter. He was like, a, He's a Congolese 
uh, he, he writes a lot about Congolese cosmology, and he talked about just how important the babysitter is in society. He said, you know, as for teenagers, it helps them to learn responsibility for, for when they're ready to have a, a child. For grandparents, it helps them to have a per sense of purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And it lets the parents still have children, but still participate in life. Mm -hmm. And he said that, that the babysitter is so important that there should be a monument made to the babysitter. And mm -hmm. so like that to me is, is that same concept. Yeah. Like everybody yeah. was the babysitter to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Well, see, your, your grandmother probably didn't realize that well, she was being part of the communal support mm -hmm. by the very fact that she was coming to get you to take care of you as well, but knowing you were going to come back to there. So it was whether she looked at it in that context, that's what was actually taking place. Mm. She was being supportive. So in part of it. She, okay, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's not like she was, she was still being a part of it and being supportive. She was helping with yeah. it. We just, yeah, just probably needed more people. The yeah, more people who could do it, the better, right? <laughs> been thinking that term because we did conditions. Yeah. You, know, you got habits and how you think of things. Mm -hmm. You're doing them for a different purpose, different reason. It may be uh, what you like or dislike that you're doing mm -hmm. it, but you're still doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you're, in, 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 you're in a part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe you will come to understand it and appreciate it at, a, mm -hmm. you know, at some point. Yeah. And then um, there, was a, there was one time you, you said, uh, this is shifting slightly, but it always stood with me. Uh, it's about uh, sometime, I think the police came to an apartment and they just missed you. There was a raid or something, they just missed you. And the way you said it to me, you was like, you almost weren't born. Do you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> So you almost wasn't born. They had just missed me. Like either you had just left. Quite a few, but it's quite a few, yeah. So I'm just curious if you wanted to talk about. Well, I'm trying to think which one is. I can't think of one. There oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well how, well, how was that too, though? To 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 know since it was quite a few. Not only are you. Well, I, I, um, I, I, but I, you're I, a parent. I, you, yeah, you I, had I, two kids because I have an older brother. Mm -hmm. well, I think my have an older brother. I think that that might have might have been the one where they came to when I was living uh, in a collective house that past the sister had baby was able to rent at around in the uh, off the lake area mm. in that area and uh, I remember that day I think it was a Saturday big it was hundreds of complex apartment buildings in the uh, apartments in the complex okay. And uh, I remember when I went out the door that day, I looked across the hall, there was a white guy, you know, I always assumed that might be the police or somebody else, but I said, <laughs> well, it could be, it could be just uh, somebody who lived there, mm -hmm. you know? And it's cause he just, he looked, he didn't say anything. It, it wasn't no hostile look, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the store and I came back about five or six and I, at the end of the hall was a door where you go down and put the garbage in. So I seen him down there, and he was putting a door, a rock in the door. Mm. So I thought he was putting a rock in the door. So I just, to me, it's just like putting a rock in the door to maybe so he can get back in when he go downstairs where the trash and stuff was. Mm. So I didn't play it no mind. But that evening, about midnight, I was in the bed, and all of a sudden, I hear the keys and trying to get into the door. And they can't get in. And I call and I said, "Who is it?" And they, oh, and I'm saying, "Who is it?" And they said, "It's it's the police. The police open up the door." Mm. And when I opened up the door, it was about one layer down here with guns, another layer up here with guns, another layer up here with guns. Mm -hmm. And they came in, and and uh, I said, right, there, right then, I think if I if anybody moved, I would probably have been if any kind of move, I probably would have been. Uh, ancestor now, as the, when they came in, they put me in the living room, and I had to sit up, and I just had on my underwear, cause, and they sit me on on the uh, sh on the chair, mm. and I just sit there. And first came in, and he seen the picture of Huey Newton, they kicked it over, called him all kinds of names, and what have you. Oh. Had this young, it was cops from every agency that you could think of, and so when he came in, after that. They put the young black cop, looked like he just made 18, 19, 20 years, 21, wow. in the living room where I was sitting, where I was, 
while they were going off, running through, the, through everything in the house. And then uh, I just went to scratch my head and he almost panicked. And so I just said, okay, I gotta be cool. And I just mm -hmm. relaxed. I didn't even move then because I knew that he was, they had psychologically- Sabotaged him. Yeah, yeah got him uh, wired up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so what happened is that they went through everything, all that kind of stuff. And then they left out because it wasn't nothing there. Because one of them come and ask me, was it booby trap? I said, no, it ain't booby trap. <laughs> I be watching too many movies. <laughs> yeah, and then what happened when he left out, he left. And so um, sometimes you don't like to go back and sell those kind of things unless you got facts because people think you're trying to make stuff up because mm -hmm. you had a lot of this stuff was going on that, yeah. during that time in different places, rage and stuff was happening. Mm -hmm. But I did go back and I let it be known what took place. Yeah. It showed up in the paper that Sunday in one of the back sections, they found a little article that said that the raid took place, but there was nothing there. Wow. Yeah. So the, yeah, Ooh. yeah. So I mean, I mean, they were, they were, they, I mean, they talk, the, the guy who was reading, he was talking crazy, you know. I'm just mm -hmm. listening. I mean, but all fear had left. I said, hey, at this time, it was going, you know, it, yeah. yeah. At a certain point, you surrender to the most high to just what yeah, it's gonna yeah. be, what it's gonna be. Let's see what it's yeah. gonna be. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And then, uh, so I was born in 74 and, and I remember you, I think the last, you stayed to the very end, 1980, right? Yeah, about six months before. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because the son, Dr. Dr. Carlton Goodlett, the son reporter, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was very supportive of the party and mm -hmm. when we bought our first upgrading of our typesetting equipment that we had to type our paper mm -hmm. on when they were upgrading. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus they kind of stood in front of the door in an office in San Francisco when we had our newspaper office. Mm -hmm. And that might have been the time too, because that was when they, uh, one of the Panthers who came back from somewhere had gotten an altercation with the police on the street and mm -hmm. came back to the office. And all of a sudden you had all these tax squad, the police out in front of the office. And, and uh, we, you had DC was there. Mm -hmm. He was you know, like field marshal, so he was in charge of taking care of every stuff that's in everybody being in plain place. Mm. He was gonna go outside the front to talk, but he seen that that was not the case because so much was out there and it was really that serious. So we had to lock the doors and we were ready to go down. Uh oh, the connection's go out the back door. Okay, you ready to go out the back door? Then went out the back door behind of, of the office and they were all out there. So at that time, we got on the phone and started calling around, let people know what was going on. And we always knew to do that. That was the first okay. thing. Okay. Yeah. Inform people in the, who we know would press, people oh. in, the, in the movement who, who could do And then something. what, they would come? They would come to the place or what? Yeah, they would come to the place or they'd get on the line and they'd be not, not trying to find out what's going on. Mm. Now, the good them was at when on the certain portal, we used to come around when I used to work there on, when they were on two blocks away from the office. Mm -hmm. Where your kids is, that's where the office used to be in San Francisco, it used to be. Oh, oh yeah, you showed me the little placard on the, on the ground. They got a commemorative yeah. placard. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Goodman came, Dr. Goodman and Mr. Flemings came and stood in front of the door, and it took about a couple of hours to calm mm -hmm. the whole situation down. So I would get to that about what now? <laughs> huh? I was, getting, I was saying that in the conjunction next to what? It was something else. Yeah, that's I don't, I don't know, because you started saying it before I finished my question. Well, <laughs> I think you were just trying, I think you were showing more incidents yeah. of where yeah. things could have ended before yeah. I was born. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Um, I wanted to know, though, after I was born, how did anything change in terms of, did you have any worries or concerns now that you're a father? Well, you were a father already because my brother was already yes, born. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't. I just was curious well, if well, having yeah, children yeah, impacted yeah, anything. We were more concerned about building and taking care of. Well, we know mm -hmm. what, the, what the commitments were, you know, in, in mm -hmm. that sense. But it wasn't. It was uh, because the children were never in harm's way. Okay, I got. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, how did you guys protect the children? How did how how did the children not? Being. Well, uh, well, the children's uh, lived in collective mm -hmm. at one point, and then sometimes, you know, um, 
stayed at the houses with the parents, but mm -hmm. then we built the house where they stayed in the collector, mm -hmm. which is still considered a landmark location. Where is that it? house on 29th Avenue off of International Way. You got to show it to me because I have memories of going there and visiting mm -hmm. the house where, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does so somebody that, does somebody yeah. live in it? Like as an individual? Yeah, people live in it, but they can't. They can't when it's landmark, a land, a landmark. They can't fix anything of it. Mm -hmm. You can't destroy anything, just like it was. Oh, but so twenty nine international. We had fixed. That was old. It was a one of the big Victorian houses. Yeah, I remember. I remember going mm -hmm. there with my mom and visiting, and nice. you know, I think uh, I had a little best friend. You drew that picture. Um, Natalie was my little best friend, yeah. and she had an mm -hmm. auntie who was a teenager, and she lived yeah. in that. Her mother, that house. mother was pamp. Yeah, her mother, and I think her her mother had a sister who was a teenager, so it's, she seemed like she was Natalie's yeah, yeah. sister. Yeah. So she lived in that hot that communal housing is what I, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we had communal house, houses where they may have stayed before, when we were putting that house together. Got that uh, got that land in that house. Mm -hmm. Definitely for the kids. Okay. And, yeah, but before that, maybe maybe stay with in collectives, different collectives together. Okay. And okay. then I also stayed at the houses where we stayed at, at, at as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, but then we weren't we weren't worried about we didn't we, we always understood that at that time there was nothing to go down at those houses where the parents and okay. the kids were. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So you guys, so that wasn't a, a worry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I remember after 1980, I remember still in the summers, I would go to the summer school. The yeah. open community still had a summer school. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a summer school. A couple of years I would do that. Yeah. yeah, you had kids from other schools and stuff would come in mm -hmm. and be a part of the summer program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they do all kinds of uh, uh, programs and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. went on many different kinds of field trips. Because the idea was always, it said, was that uh, we weren't about teaching the kids what to think, but how to think. So mm -hmm. they can, uh, and that's why I was engaged, ask questions, what you think about this, what you think about that, when we mm -hmm. see films, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that we weren't trying to negate from looking at anything or any perspective, but how to be understanding. In the context, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't think of any more questions today. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to think. We're gonna do this again. I'm gonna ask people to um, send me questions to see what they want to find out about our relationship in terms of as two artists creating you, mm -hmm. this and me. Mm -hmm. I'm continuing to write and continuing to coach people. Well, you've writing. been inspired by it, being inspired by it, being inspired with, but one finds their own way on how they want to do things themselves. And in the case of yourself, that's what I've observed it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, over with the, uh, developing and observing and putting it into work to mm -hmm. lay the foundation for what you're doing mm -hmm. and, and continue to do it. And is it true? Did you manage the lump in? Somebody told me that you, at one point, you managed them. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a book out on that. It's a book that talks about that. The whole, whole. And it mentions you as managing them? Well, it mentions, in the sense, yeah, I'm banishing them, yes. Uh, you know, I was Tell people who the lumpings are. Everybody might not know who the lumpings are. Well, it was, uh, uh, Lumpin was a uh, group, a singing group that sung popular songs, but put revolutionary ly lyrics to them. And they also created songs themselves. And they were members uh, of the Black, Black Panther Party. Party. Uh, musicians and had yeah. a band, also had a band with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of them went on and to sing with Marvin Gaye, right? From a Marxist word, from the, the dreads of society, mm -hmm. the lowest. Mm -hmm. So in relationship to those who can't get a job, now don't want no job, ain't looking for no job, don't care <laughs> about it, outside of society. Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, just don't, yeah. And some of those musicians went on to sing with popular. Well, one of them went on. Uh, Mar uh, Michael Torrance went on to be back up and do coordination, uh, smoke songs, and did uh, uh, the uh, the for Marvin Gaye mm -hmm. for, for many years. Yeah, there's maybe a few of them. Bill Calhoun, a few others. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. 
But it, it talked about it. It got an article, a couple of articles I had on my Facebook I could send you. Okay, yeah. Recently, that was sent not too long ago. So the Black Panther Party, we had the visual art, we had the music. Did yeah, you know? all, all that come out of the movement. It was inspired by the movement itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that I happened to hear them singing. Mm -hmm. And then I came to them talking about how it could be used to inform and educate and like the, the community through the music. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, we talked to, I talked to David Hilliard, mm -hmm. who was the chief of staff who was in charge. Mm -hmm. And he agreed and he suggested the name The Lumpin'. Mm. So when, but, but, but what happens because everybody in the party got different perspectives, come from different vanity points, different yeah. levels of consciousness, and that's all coming together. There was all sorts of channels that sometimes them didn't have to do the work and in between that being able to practice. Mm -hmm. Whereas when that was come to the point where they couldn't get to practice, they would come to me to ask to see if I could work it out, arrange it, and I would do that. I was mm -hmm. always the one who would go and talk on their behalf mm -hmm. so they could have the time to practice also. So uh, when we had, when I was going to- Do you ever miss it? Well, it, it, you know, what we, 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 we elders now, <laughs> it ain't gonna get, we moving forward. You know, you, 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 we, talk, we talk about it from time but to time. y'all are still really connected. Like I remember at Huey's funeral, I, I went, you weren't, weren't you a pallbearer at Huey's funeral? Mm -hmm. Weren't you a pallbearer at Huey, Huey's funeral? Yeah, Huey Newton's and little everybody, little. all the Panthers were there, and then afterwards, y'all instantly start organizing <laughs> where y'all gonna go, who need a ride, who going to go to the, you know, to the after, the repast and all this stuff. Like, y'all are all still very connected, and when y'all see each other, it's Oh, very yeah, well, you know, that's just the camaraderie is there, you know, yes, definitely. Yes. I mean, you, yes. have, you have to understand, there were people come in with different, whatever attitudes and stuff you had, you brought that into the party. Mm -hmm. So we had to have a process of cleansing those kinds of things to working together as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as everybody who go committed, who did work, who mm -hmm. carried that spirit on with them as they continue on life's journey, mm -hmm. you know, and they and they're, whatever they do, you know. Yeah. I mean, you had people in the party. After I said the party was one, you had people come in who were from petty bourgeois thinking class. Mm -hmm. Trump from the lumping point of view and in between. Mm -hmm. You had some people who had didn't have skills and developed their skills because now they're working for something that they appreciated and mm -hmm. wanted to be a part of that was helping the community. Mm -hmm. You had those dynamics that went into it. You had people who come in who some were Muslims, some were Rastas, some were Christians, some were atheists, they were Buddha, all that. But put all that and put it aside to work together. Mm -hmm. You see, other, and that, that was the, the strength of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Black Panther Party as well. That was yeah. strong strength, you know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, thank you, Daddy. Thanks for talking with me about art and culture and, and blocks, creative blocks. That's what we started talking about. And I think that's so important because ultimately the core of my course is that I help people develop the tools and the confidence to be able to write their books. And a lot of times what gets in the way is this concept of a writer's block or a yeah. creative block. Yeah. And so I help them develop strategies to not, to not only, uh, to get, not only just get through the blocks, but to understand what it is and use the so-called blocks. And, and that's good. That's good. You know, cause in the party, I was with a different setup. We mm -hmm. were working 20, uh, seven days a week, 24 yeah. hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yeah. So everything was urgent in many ways. You see what I'm saying? And that helps creativity, though. Yeah. That, that yeah. idea of urgency, because then you're like, you don't have as much time to doubt yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you, you know what you do, it may, may not come out how you want it, but then you can evaluate it and improve it on the next work that you and do. And that's important, too. That idea of, you know, get it done. Don't worry about being perfect. Just get it done. And it'll mm -hmm. be better each time, but you it won't be better. It, 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 yeah, it. It, evaluate it, you know, or you, even if you want to put it to a side, come back to it. Once you mm -hmm. feel that, that you've got enough and you're ready to come back to it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I put down stuff for, for almost 10, 15 years before I came back to it. <laughs> That's a good point. Free of the wood and I'll be, do that, but I'm doing something else in between that, you know. That part too. That's what I want people to understand too. It's like, 
yeah, I mean, you can put stuff to the side, it marinates or whatever, and you can still create while that's over there. You can still create, you can still do something for the short term and for the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then also real quick, you had mentioned about how you remix, remix your own stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that that's important too. Like when we talked about how there's nothing new under the sun and you were like, yeah, and how you remix your own stuff. I think that's important for people to yeah. understand too. Oh, once oh you yeah, get yeah. That came about a lot I of mm -hmm. it. It came <laughs> from uh, when, how the response feedback. When people yeah. say, well, even a lot of youngsters when I do these talks and what have you, mm -hmm. uh, they would say how you could just tweak something here in the art or tweak something there from the art mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. And yeah. how it would be just like today. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, I, you know, I began to. You can I repurpose guess, it. Repurpose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's something that you see actually uh, when, when people contribute, contributors to, um, to, um, to magazines and, you know, um, mm -hmm. when they write articles, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people repurpose their work and then send it to a different publication. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, mm -hmm. you can rewrite a book that you have and you can, like you said, tweak it and you can rewrite it for a different audience. For yeah, whom? I, I, right? remix, I call it remixing. I remix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we did it today. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to call you again. We're going to do another one. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Get Bye. Up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay.